Acknowledge the Lord with thankfulness for investment. Investment is one of my favorite things. Ever since I was a little kid, and that was quite a few years ago, but uh, I've always enjoyed doing things and seeing it gross out into something bigger. I have always, for the last two years, or three years, not spent any change. At the end of the day, I usually put it in the in the jar, and then I roll it up and bring it out. This month, the Lord has caused everything to be $10.04. So I would get the maximum change back. But... Uh, over last year, I, I don't remember the exact number, it was 300 and something dollars and just not spending your change. So if you're looking for something to do, take your change out every night and then go through your next day as routine as you can and keep that change for the Lord. So I'm going to ask you if you would come down. I got a bowl uh, offering plate here that you would bring your monthly offering down for investment. Let's have prayer first. Father, thank you so much for everything you have done for us, the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us and the ones we don't know. Thank you for taking care of us and loving us. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today just happens to be the 330th birthday of one of the world's greatest composers, Johann Sebastian Bach. To honor that birthday, I've decided to play for a prelude, the Toccata from the Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Please do not be alarmed. Many individuals hear this piece usually during Halloween. It was not intended for Halloween. One of the reasons I like this piece is that Bach, on most of his compositions, wrote at the very end of it, Soli Deo Gloria. In other words, to God be the glory. So to give God the glory and to honor this great composer and to showcase this magnificent instrument, we give you Takata from Takata and Fugue in D minor. Before you get, begin, brother, let me go ahead and have prayer to close Sabbath school. And then if any of you have um, investment offering that you'd like to place in the bowl, you can come do that uh, while he plays our offertory for us. Let's bow our heads to close our Sabbath school program. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful for the Sabbath. Thank you for everything that you give us. We are so blessed. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us in this worship service, that uh, our hearts and our minds would be open to hear your voice. We thank you for your tutelage that you provide to us daily, the chastening, the learning. May we learn to humble ourselves before you and know that you are God, recognize that you alone are righteous and wise. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
morning. Good morning, church. I really enjoy the, uh, the nice weather we've got. It's kind of bittersweet for me. With the warm weather, it brings allergies, so I kind of deal with it for a couple of weeks. Um, I'd like to go through announcements at this time, and uh, we welcome uh, Golden Cords from Union College. We appreciate them visiting with us today. <clears throat> Uh, VBS Benefit Brunch is coming up on Sunday, April 26th, and we have a sign-up sheet in the uh, Narthex for supplies and material for that breakfast, so all hands on deck for that, and please get with Heather uh, Matthews if, if you need to chat with her. Um, we have a sanctuary renewal project. Uh, everyone is sitting on some nice, comfortable seats. Uh, those have been deteriorating over time, the, the fabric, and that is what that project is, to uh, replace the fabric as it's, as it's worn beyond repair. So that's kind of a long-term project that, that we're looking forward to and um, raising money for that. Uh, Youth Week of Prayer, as you see at the bottom of your announcements, will be held at the Central Church, uh, and that begins tonight from 6.30 to 8. Uh, that concludes our announcements, and we'll now enter into our worship service. If you could bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for bringing us together to worship and praise you together. Please guide and be with us. In your name we pray, amen. Our first song that we're going to sing is called Mighty to Save by Laura Story. And sometimes I like to look up why the artist wrote a certain song or sings a certain song. And I found she says this, though I enjoyed learning it and sharing it with our team, it wasn't until we were leading this song one worship, one morning during worship that the truth of this powerful anthem began to grip my heart. Zephaniah 3.17 tells us that God is mighty to save. But what does that mean? Is it Old Testament prophets speaking about the power of the gospel to bring hopeless, lifeless souls into a transforming encounter with Christ? Or is he referring to the sheer mo momentum by which God is building his church, a, powerful, a power so great that the gates of hell cannot prevail? Or maybe Zephaniah was speaking of God's heart for redeeming those from every tongue and tribe and nation. Each time I sing the song, God brings to mind new implications of this verse. And each time, I get a little lump in my throat as I consider that by his might, God saved me. It's hard to fathom why a God who is able to move mountains would choose to focus his strength on redeeming the very souls who have deep, so deeply offended him. But this is the gospel. Though we have done nothing to merit God's favor, God, full of mercy and grace, sent his son, only son, Jesus, to pay the debt we could never pay. He is truly mighty to save.
can I keep from singing? stand for our introit number one praise to the lord your heads. Dear Lord, thank you again for bringing us all together on this beautiful Sabbath day. Please allow us to continue to praise you, not just today, but as we move forward every day. In your name we pray, amen. Please remain standing for opening song number 341, To God Be the Glory.
You may be seated. Our scripture this morning will be taken from Psalms 146. Psalms 146. It's a short chapter. Praise you, the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea and all therein, which keeps truth forever which executes judgment for the oppressed, which gives food to the hungry. The Lord loosens the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises them that are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord preserves the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, even your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise you, the Lord. At this point, would you please kneel with me for prayer? dear gracious and heavenly father we come to you humbly today to sing and speak of your praise and glory of which is not possible without your evident power we thank you for the blessings that you give each one of us those that are known and unknown we ask now for your continued guidance as we walk through this world We ask for your healing power where you will allow it. We ask for your strength, Lord. Please be with each one of us today as we go about praising you and showing others your light. Dear Lord, please be with Union College. Guide them as they bring new people into our lives, teaching us and others. Thank you again for your blessings, your love, and your care. Your name we pray. Amen. Hello. Happy Sabbath. So it looks like all the kids from Westwood um, School are all sick, and I was asked to replace them. But before I sing, I would like to tell a story that happened in my family. So 15 years ago, my dad, he left home to go to work, and I was home. Um, I didn't have class that day. And less than an hour later, 
he called. He was, I don't know if he was angry, or, but he was kind of screaming on the phone, asking to talk with my mother. And I, I just passed the phone to her. And then she just threw the phone and then screamed, Dad was shot. And then I was started screaming, uh, screaming and crying. And she just, next thing I saw, she stopped a car in the middle of the street. And she asked the guy to drive to where my, da my dad was. And um, my dad was parked in a gas station and waiting to have his car washed. And his car was parked right in front of the store. And the store was being robbed. And when the guys left to finish the, the rob, <laughs> the robber, I don't know. But anyway, uh, he, they came to my dad with a gun, pointing a gun to him, and, and they asked him to get out of the car. And he moved to get his wallet. And then when he moved like this, they shot him right on his chest. And when he saw the hole in his chest and the blood coming out, he thought he had only a few minutes to leave and then he started making calls. And the second call he made was to, my, to me. And he said that he loved me and he was dying, but <laughs> oh, he loved me. And I started crying and asking him to stop saying that because he wasn't dying. And um, I, then we hung up and I started crying and, and asking God why that was happening. And then when my dad arrived to the hospital, um, the doctor looked at his exams and he asked uh, him if he believed in God because what had happened, it was a miracle. The bullet had made a 360 degree curve in his body, entering his chest and exit here right in the middle of his chest. And uh, I don't know if James has the pictures. He's, he, this is the shirt we, we saved for 15 years. <laughs> that's where the bullet entered and that's where it exit. And exa it, the bullet exit without damaging any bone or any organ. Um, every time I think about this story, it makes me think how powerful God is. You might not have an extraordinary story like that. And you may also wonder why God doesn't do a miracle like that for you. But a changed heart and salvation are the greatest miracles. And those are what each one of us can experience. Uh, I'm going to sing in Portuguese. Uh, but uh, we, have, uh, we have some translation for you. <laughs> Curou a sua alma com perdão. 
Não espere um animal com você falar Para entender que Deus trabalha sem parar E algo novo sempre está a preparar Não espere pão e peixe para a multidão mas enxergue a todo instante Deus falando aos corações Pessoas que no fim da vida encontram salvação E isso nem a morte pode lhes tirar Thank you, Anna. This time we'll have children's story, and that will be brought by Bob Boaz. I'm getting fingers this way and that way. <laughs>
if you treat others the, the way you would like to be treated, doesn't that make sense that maybe they'll treat you the same way back? So anyway, the story I'm going to tell today is a story that um, I'm told is a true story and happened about 50 years ago, probably here in St. Louis. I don't know if all the details, the way I'm going to tell the story, are exactly the way it happened, but the, um, the events actually, I'm, I'm told, took place. And the story is about a man, I, I don't know his name, I'm just going to call him Tom, just because I like the name Tom. And um, Tom was, was really kind of down on his luck. He was going through a bad part of his life. He, um, the economy wasn't very good, and he'd lost his job, and he didn't have any income coming in. And he was looking hard for a job every day. So he was going out and driving around looking for a job. Um, he had even gotten a notice from the bank that he hadn't been paying the mortgage on his house and, and he was maybe going to lose his house. And he didn't have money to feed his kids and to give clothing to his kids and his wife. And he was just really, really depressed. And so he was doing a lot of praying and he was looking for a job. And the good news was one day he actually got a job interview. So he, he got an appointment to go talk to a man about a job. So he got in his car, and he was driving to his appointment to go see about his job. And on his way there, you know, he's thinking all the things he's going to say and what he's going to do and what he's going to, you know, impress the people with so that maybe they'll offer him a job. And as he's driving, he gets on the highway, and he sees, he sees on the side of the highway a car over on the shoulder. And the, uh, the flashers are on, it's blinking, you know, and the car's pulled over, and there's a man standing outside just kind of looking at the car. So he thinks to himself, well, I, I really need to help that guy. So he pulls over to the side of the road, he walks back, and he talks to the man, and he says, you know, what's the problem? And the man says, well, I have a flat tire. And he says, I must have ran over some nails or something in the road yesterday or the day before because I had a flat tire yesterday, and I already took my spare tire, and I put it on my car, and now i got a flat tire on the other side of the car. So Tom is thinking, boy, you know, this is, this is really a bad thing for this man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and help him. So he says, you know, I, I have a spare tire in my car, and I, I think it might fit on your car. Let's try and see if it'll fit, and maybe we can get you going again until you can get a tire somewhere else. So Tom goes back to his car, opens the trunk, takes out the jack, comes back, jacks up the man's car, takes off his tire. Tom puts his spare tire on the car, you know, takes the man's flat tire, puts it back in his trunk, and he says, I, I really have to go now. I have an appointment. And he jumps in the car and drives away. And he goes to where he's going, gets in, walks in, sees the lady there at the front desk and says, you know, I, I realize now I'm five or ten minutes late, but I had an appointment for a job interview, and I, and I'm, I need to see the owner of the company. Where I was going to talk to him about a job. The lady says, well, well, that's okay. The man just got here himself. And sure enough, when he goes in for the job interview, who do you think was sitting behind that desk waiting to talk to him? Anybody have a guess? It was the man whose tire he helped change. So... <laughs> That was the good news, but the bad news was, you know, after interviewing with the man, the man said, you know, Tom said, I was coming here today, I knew I had this interview with you this morning, but I already offered the job to somebody yesterday. And so Tom was feeling a little bit upset, but he said, I'll, I got another part of this, you know, that, that I want to tell you. He goes, you know, I, I have some property that I have bought in out on the west side of town, and it's a very big, very big amount of property. I have about 400 acres out here, and I've built my big house, and there's a caretaker house on this property, and I need somebody to be caretaker of this property. And the job will pay the same, and you'll also get to live in the caretaker house, and there'll be a car for you to drive or a truck for you to drive, and I just, I really appreciate that you stopped and helped me on the road today, and I can see what a good person you are, and I can see how helpful you are, and how much you know about taking care of things, and I would like to offer you the job as the caretaker. And believe it or not, I'm told that, that Tom actually lived on this property where this man had this home and, and lived in the caretaker house until the day he died. He raised his family there, and he actually lived there until the day he died and became friends with the man that owned this company. And I just thought that was a really neat story because as you know, in the Bible, there, there's another story that Jesus told 
about some folks out on a road. Does anybody know that story? And somebody was on the side of the road. They didn't have cars back then, but there, does anybody know that story? Can anyone tell me the name of it? You ever heard the story of the Good Samaritan? You've heard that one. All right. The Good Samaritan. The man was robbed and beaten, and he was laying beside the road. And do you know that two people walked right by him and didn't stop to help him, but one person did stop and help him finally and took him to a hotel and paid the hotel bill and paid the medical bills for the man. And um, Jesus told that story, and he told us that that's the way we should act. At the end of the story, he said, that's what you should do. And I just wanted you guys to remember that. If you treat people a certain way, they're going to treat you the same way. And even if they don't, it's the right thing to do because that's what Jesus tells us to do. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for our opportunity to be here today and to learn about you. And we ask now that as we go back to our seats that you keep in our hearts and minds that we should always follow the golden rule and we should always witness for you by helping others. In your name we pray. Amen. Imagine the disciples' reaction to the Great Commission, a seemingly overwhelming task. The mandate to take the gospel to the entire world seemed impossible. How could such a small group of disciples make any significant impact on the mighty Roman Empire? First century Roman society was dominated by political intrigue, rampant materialism, self-centered pride, all-consuming greed, blatant immorality, and religious superstitions. Steeped in millennia of tradition, Jerusalem did not appear to be fertile territory for the prospect of the gospel. Fortunately, the Great Commission was accompanied by a great promise. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Today, we have the opportunity to participate in this great commission by giving a generous offering to the conference evangelism. This offering provides the financial support for the many outreach ministries occurring in the churches across our conference. Thank you for indicating on a commitment card that you believe God would have you give during the year of evangelism. Would the deacons please come forward? And just as a reminder, please mark your envelopes accordingly and that all loose offering and unmarked will go to the local church budget. Please bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for uh, allowing us to work for you each day. In the, in the order of evangelism, please guard, guide the hearts and minds of each of us to give freely to further your work. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. God has a mission in the world, and one of the great things about Union College is that we're committed to being involved in God's mission in our world. We've taken as the name of our group the Golden Chords. And for those of you who know something about Union College, you recognize that there's a real connection. Uh, in 1906, Union College began to hang golden cords, symbolizing the connection between Union College and those who have gone overseas in mission service. We've taken that word chords and uh, changed it a little differently to make it a musical chord. And we're eager to share with you some music from uh, the string uh, repertoire today. Um, I'm Edward Allen. I teach in the Division of Religion. And I began playing the cello at Union College 50 years ago. Um, after that, my parents went to the Philippines for five years. And uh, I went to school at La Sierra and Singapore and Andrews University. And um, only after I returned to Union College about 10 years ago did I pick the cello up again and begin playing it again, uh, more or less, uh, with the groups that are uh, there at Union College. And uh, I began working with the Golden Chords about five years ago when my colleague Tom Shefford left and uh, went to uh, Andrews University. This morning we're going to share with you a program of music and the spoken word that uh, focuses upon God's mission and, and our relationship to him. Uh, our songs uh, actually are, are in forms of praise and prayer to God. Uh, we'll be playing for you uh, the song, As the deer panteth for the waters, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. Then uh, we will focus upon how God is more precious to us than silver. And uh, then a simple song, I Love You, Lord. Uh, Kyle Smith, who's uh, from St. Louis, uh, is going to share the homily with us. And uh, finally, we'll conclude with uh, uh, a rousing song, Great is the Lord. Uh, our group today is made up of uh, uh, Melissa Burton from the state of Maine, a communications major playing the piano, uh, Alina Herber uh, from the state of California, St. Alina, who is an international rescue and relief major. And if you're interested in finding out all the fun and fabulous things that international rescue and relief is all about, you want to talk to her after the uh, service today and Kian Mapp, who is an IRR graduate. Am I right? Yes. So she's been on all those fun and fantastic things. And Kian is uh, working in our uh, teaching learning center right now. Um, uh, and Kyle is a junior theology major uh, from the uh, St. Louis area. And uh, Kyle's planning to come to Iowa, Missouri uh, starting this summer. Uh, spending the, the next while uh, working with uh, Bhutanese refugees, if I remember correctly. So uh, we're just grateful that we're able to be with you today. Let's join together in praising God, praying to him uh, for who he is, and uh, grateful that he's given us a part in his mission today.
Happy Sabbath. How's everyone doing today? Am I all mic'd up? Can you hear me? Is everything good? Yes? No? A little bit? Try to... Am I good? Testing one, two. There we go. I think we got it. As most of you may know, my name is Kyle Smith. Uh, Dr. Allen gave me a good little introduction. Um, I'm from the St. Louis area. My family goes to the Mid Rivers Church where my mom teaches uh, a Sabbath school class. And I kind of grew up going to the West County Church off and on a little bit. I would come with Sunnydale tours and things like that. And I've never gotten to preach here. And so I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited to preach here. And I'm excited to get to spend Sabbath with you guys. Uh, it's an honor. And I see a lot of friends in the audience, like my boy Aaron Tan. Uh, we canvassed this summer, and so it's good to see him here, uh, Kayla, and some other people. Um, and today, I'm going to try to keep it a little short for you guys, because we have had some, some talented people, whether it be your own church members or the Union College um, Golden Cords. So I'm sorry that I'm not as talented as them, um, but I don't want potluck to burn. And West County is known for superb potlucks. I don't know if you know that, but whenever I was at Sunnydale and we were going to come here, we always rejoiced when we found out we were going to West County for the church service. So praise the Lord. But let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, it is getting warm outside, but some of our hearts are cold. Father, this morning I ask that you will melt our hearts of stone. Come into our lives today, fill us with the Holy Spirit, and may your word speak to us. May it inspire us, revive us, Father. Lord, I am nothing. You are everything. Hide this preacher today. Empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In your name, amen. So a couple of weeks ago, I got a call from the Rocky Mountain Conference. In Rocky Mountain Conference, they have this event called Winterfest every single year. And it's intended for the kids when they're coming off of uh, break, spring break, to be able to go to... Um, this spiritual revival at the end of their skiing trips. How many of you like to ski? Not I. I went snowboarding one time and I went flying down the mountain and fell. I turned in my snowboard and I'm done. But they want the kids to be able to have a spiritual revival at the end of the week. And so they asked me if I would come out and if I would um, do the photography. I do photography for Union College. I'm the ASB photographer. And I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to do the photography for you guys. Not a problem. And they said, we'll pay for your car, we'll pay for your food, we'll pay for your stay. Everything will be free. Hallelujah. I'm a college kid. I enjoy free trips. And a free trip to Silverthorne, Colorado in the mountains is not a bad gig. And so the week was progressing, and I called up Enterprise, and I said, listen, I need the cheapest car you have. I need a tin can. I need something with wheels, and I want the door to cling when I slam it. I don't want this to be a nice car. It needs to be cheap. And so the guy, he tried to kind of convince me, Mr. Smith, how tall are you? Mr. Smith, you're, you seem to be a large man. You may want a bigger car. No, listen to me. I need a tin can, man. I need a little car. And so he said, all right, we have a Chevy, uh, Chevy Spark. Chevy Spark is kind of like a smart car. And I said, all right, I'll take this car and I will fly through the mountains with it. And so I got there Friday morning. I had my best friend Mackenzie Jean drop me off. And as I looked in the parking lot, there were no tin cans. There were no Chevy Sparks. And I began to panic and I began to say to Mackenzie, Mackenzie, what, what am I going to drive? Because they had Dodge Caravans, but they had this beautiful baby blue Dodge Charger. And I heard these stories before about uh, people going to rental car facilities. They run out of their, their model, and so they have to get this free upgrade. And so I'm walking in with my bag, and I said, Lord, if today is the day, your servant will drive the Dodge Charger. <laughs> and so <laughs> I walked in, and they checked me in, and they said, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry, but we are out of the Chevy Spark but we have a Dodge Charger. It's the second highest upgrade. Would you be willing, you know, maybe you're wanting the fuel economy, but would you be willing to take this Chevy Spark? And I said, sir, I can make that sacrifice. I will drive the Dodge Charger. 
not a problem. Now, I'm assuming some of you have driven rental cars. And when you go to a rental car facility, they do this thing where they, they find it necessary to tell you what a vehicle is. They assume that you've never seen an automobile in your life. And so they walk you outside and they say, uh, this is a tire and uh, this is a trunk and this is the door. They're showing you all these things and they're pointing out the little flaws and dings. And then they get you in the car and they, they start showing you how everything works. This is the radio. This is the push to start. Because, you know, we've, we've never seen cars before. And, and so they have to show us all these things. And I remember I was in the car and I was with a really really big African-American man named William. And he was just a big man. He looked like he had played sports his whole life. And William and I were sitting in there, and he had found out that I had been assistant youth pastoring at College View Church in, in Lincoln. And he said, ah, oh, you're a preacher. And so he's messing with me, and he's turning on the Christian radio stations, Blair and Chris Tomlin. This is your jam. This is what you like, isn't it, pastor? And he's messing with me. But in the midst of his jokes and in the midst of his uh, showing me what the car is, he stopped and he said, Kyle, can I ask you something? He said, I'm struggling, man, and I need a little bit of wisdom. And in the midst of our jokes and conversation, it got kind of serious. And I said to him, I said, man, I don't have a lot of wisdom, but I, but I wouldn't you know, mind talking to you for a little bit about stuff. And he said, Kyle, I'm really struggling right now because 12 years ago, I left Lincoln, Nebraska to move to Chicago with my fiance." And my fiance and I, we had an infant child, an infant baby. And he said, when I left, I left my son Trey and my daughter with their mother. And he said, the problem is, Kyle, is that now I'm back in Lincoln. I've been here for three years. And my kids, they want absolutely 100% nothing to do with me. He said, I've gone to their school events. I've gone to their birthday parties. I've tried driving them to doctor's appointments and just really seeking them out in every aspect of their lives. But he said, they don't want me at all. They don't give me the time of day. They turn their back to me. They give me nasty, dirty looks. They talk bad about me to their mother. And he said, Kyle, I have given up, man. He said, I haven't talked to my kids in three months. I've stopped seeking them. And he said, the problem is, is Nebraska Wesleyan, it's a very big school in, in Lincoln, very known throughout Nebraska. He said, they called me up the other day and they said, William, your son Trey runs track phenomenally and we want to offer him a full ride through Nebraska Wesleyan. Would you mind setting up a meeting time with your son for us? And he said, Kyle, the problem is, is I haven't talked to Trey in three months. How am I going to call him up and say, hey, Trey, I know I haven't been a part of your life, but now that you're going to be a track star, I'm here. Let's set the meeting up, baby. Let's get it going. And he just had a lot of pain, a lot of fear in his eyes. And I remember sitting there with him, and he said, I don't know if I should give Trey the number and have him deal with it, or if I should set this up and introduce him to him. And I remember going through the options with him and talking to him about the potential of what would happen if he didn't tell Trey about this opportunity and what could happen if he did. And I told him one thing. I said, Will, think about this. Five years from now, your son didn't go to college. He's sitting at home, and he doesn't have a job, or he's working some, you know, seven fifty an hour job because he never was told that he had a full ride to Nebraska Wesleyan. How would he feel? And he kind of thought about these things. He molded over. But then I remember praying with him. And I don't know what Will is doing right now. I don't know if he told his son Trey about this opportunity. I don't know if he's going to tell him. And I don't know what's going to happen to them. But there's one thing that I remember. I remember leaving that rental car place in my car. In the whole eight-hour drive to Silverthorne, Colorado, I had one thing on my mind. And I even called my mom, and I talked to her a little bit about it. And it was the fact that just like Will had been rejected by his children, how many times in our lives do we push away, do we reject our Heavenly Father? How many times in our lives does God come to us and seeks us out, says, son, I want great things for you. Son, I want to be a part of your life. Daughter, I want to know you more. How many times does this happen, but we push God away? We turn our back to him, and we only come to him when we need something. And I begin to think to myself, is God going to give up on me? 
Is God going to be like Will? And is he going to say, I've had enough of you, Kyle. I'm finished. Sayonara. I'm done. But suddenly I was reminded of a story in the Bible, a parable called The Lost Sheep in Luke 15. And for time's sake, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this parable. But today I just want to take a few minutes to kind of pick this apart. And it's in Luke 15, and it starts in verse 1. And I just want to kind of set the scene. Christ is outside of the synagogue, outside of the temple. And he's talking to some tax collectors, some sinners, some, you know, dirty sinners, dirty people. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they're sitting on their high horse and they're saying, look at Jesus over there, talking to the sinners. This man claims to be righteous. He claims to be the son of God. But look at him over there. Why does Jesus eat with sinners? Why does Jesus talk to the tax collectors? And the text actually says that they were standing there grumbling, standing there scoffing away Jesus. He claims to be holy. He's not very holy. Because at that time, who you affiliated with yourself with, that's who you were. We kind of think that way today as well. And so if you were a righteous, good, holy person, Lord forbid that you spend some time with a sinner. And they're having this conversation, and Jesus is overhearing them. And we see that Jesus is going to do something here. He's going to share a parable with them that is not only going to explain why he is eating with these people and hanging out with them, but he is going to define his mission in this world. And out of the blue, as they're talking about him, Jesus opens up in verse 4. And he says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and goes after the one that is lost until he finds it? Jesus says, if you have a hundred sheep, one of them goes missing, aren't you going to go and try to find it? Isn't that what you would do? And whenever I've read this text, it's always been kind of odd to me. It's been kind of strange. Why does Jesus say this as such a direct statement? He doesn't ask this as a genuine question, but he is saying, if you had a hundred sheep and one went missing, wouldn't you go and try to find it? And this has never made sense with me because I've done a little bit of business. I've done a, a couple things in my long 21 years. And when you have a business, if you have great gains, there's always a little bit of loss. And in my mind, if, if you have a hundred sheep and one goes missing, isn't it just a part of the game that one might get lost? And I've never understood the love of a shepherd. You see, at that time, when a shepherd would lose a sheep, he would go and he would try to find it. He would risk his life for days going and searching and looking for his sheep that is lost. And Jesus knows this. And I've never understood this, but a couple of weeks ago this made sense. I was at my girlfriend Annie's house, and her dad is a farmer. And he has corn and soybeans and he has sheep. And all the sheep were lambing. This means that they were having babies. And we went over to the sheep pen to visit and to look at all the sheep and to see them. And I remember when we walked over to the gate, a little lamb came running up to us. And he poked his little head through the sheep pen and he got out and he just came prancing around us. And Annie looked at him and said, oh, hi, Finland. They named it Finland. I don't know why. But Finland came up to us, and she's talking to it, and it's licking my calves, and it's jumping up on me, and it was like a little dog. And I remember sitting there throughout the week watching Finland, watching the other sheeps, sheeps, <laughs> watching the, the lambs. I'm not a farmer, guys. I'm, we're city folk here. But <laughs> I remember watching the lambs and watching the sheep, and I thought to myself, man, how does Bruce, Annie's dad, how does he watch these lambs die? Because sometimes when he has lambs, they die. They don't make it through the night. And I remember thinking to myself, how does he deal with this? How does he cope with this? And I said to myself, if anything ever happened to Finland, I would go and I would try to find him. If he went running away, I would go chase the little guy down. If, if he was sick, I would try to give him some lamb booster to get him going again. I would be sad if he died. What Christ is saying here is if you have a hundred sheep and one goes missing, aren't you going to try to save it? Aren't you going to try to rescue it? And now, understanding the love of a shepherd, I say yes. Of course I would try to find Finland. And then Christ continues on in the text 
He says in verse 5, And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. He talks about a sheep being lost, one out of a hundred, going and searching for it, going and trying to find it. And then he says, when you find the sheep, you're excited. You're joyous. You're happy. You're going to call your friends. You're going to call your wife. You're going to call everybody you know and say, I found the little sheep. He's back. And now I think to myself, yeah, if Finland went missing, I'd call Annie. Hey, Annie, I know you were bummed. Your sheep went missing. I found him. But then Jesus does something interesting in verse 7. He kind of makes it hit home. He does something cool because he takes this cute little illustration, this cute little parable about a sheep, and he applies it to you and I. In verse 7, he says, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Immediately, Jesus switches the script and he applies it to heaven. He applies it to you and I and he says, in heaven, when a sheep goes missing, when a human goes missing, we find it, we seek it out, we go and get it, we bring it back home and we rejoice. And by Jesus saying this, what he's essentially saying is, West County Church, Kyle Smith, Pharisees and scribes, you are the lost sheep. You're sinners. We're sinners. I'm a sinner. You are the lost sheep. But I am the good shepherd. And because of that, I go and I search for my sheep. I go and try to find them. And the cool thing about shepherds at that time is that they would not stop searching until they knew what happened to the sheep. Whether it was dead or alive, they had to know what happened. Christ is saying, I am going to search for you. I am going to seek for you like these shepherds until I know what has happened to you. Whether you be dead or alive, I am going to seek you and find you. And by Jesus saying this, he is not only explaining to them why he goes and eats with the sinners why he goes and spends time in the dark corners of the city, but he is defining his mission because as we look at the life of Christ, he is continually and constantly seeking people. Whether it be going down to heal the sick, whether it be looking for sinners so he could save them, whether it be looking for all of the children and saying, come to me, he was always searching and seeking for people. And in this story, what Christ is saying, when I go to the bars, I'm not getting drunk. When I go hang out with the prostitutes, I'm not partaking. When I'm going to the dark corners of the city, I'm not doing dark deeds. I am seeking them. Because I want to rescue them and bring them home to my Father. And when we look at this story We haven't spent much time on it, but when we look at it and study it, we can learn that we serve a God who seeks us, who is relentlessly in pursuit of you and I. And when we take this text, we can conclude that our Heavenly Father is seeking us daily. Mrs. White makes a statement about the seeking power of God that I wanted to read for us today. It's in Steps to Christ. I'm sure we've all read it. Page 21. She says, The heart of God yearns over his earthly children with a love stronger than death. In giving up his son, he has poured out to us all of heaven in one gift, the Savior's life and death and intercession, the ministry of the angels, the pleading of the Holy Spirit, the Father working above and through all, the unceasing intercession of the heavenly beings. All of these are enlisted on behalf of man's redemption. Oh, let us contemplate the amazing sacrifice that has been made for us. Let us try to appreciate the labor and energy that heaven is expending to reclaim the lost and bring them back to the Father's house. God is relentlessly, persistently pursuing us and seeking us. And unlike our earthly fathers, 
unlike earthly parents or earthly friends, when we do God wrong, he does not give up on us because God is not afraid of our reaction. God is not afraid to seek us. Will was afraid to seek his son Trey because he was afraid of what he might do. He might reject me. He might push me away. He might spit in my face. God is not afraid of your rejection. He's not afraid of your response. And he's not afraid of your sin. God is not afraid to seek you. And because of that, he is persistently, relentlessly pursuing us. A poet in the 1800s once said that God, Christ, is the hound of heaven. Sniffing the trail of every lost sinner, trying to find them, to bring them back home. God is pursuing us. And so what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for you and I right now? God is seeking your husband. God is seeking your wife. God is seeking your children. God is seeking your neighbor. God is seeking your friends. And God is seeking you. And the question that I propose today When God comes to your corner of the world, when he says, Kyle, I want you to know me more. Warren, I want you to know me more. How are you going to respond? Are you going to respond by pushing him away, by spitting in his face, by turning your back to him? Are you going to respond with open arms and say, Father, thank you for seeking me. Because I was lost, but now I am found. And for those of you who have accepted Jesus and who have felt the seeking power of God before, I want you to take a moment this Sabbath. It doesn't have to be now. It doesn't have to be right after church. It can be tonight. And spend some time thinking about how God has sought you out your whole life. How he has continually, step by step, year by year, month by month, morning by morning, sought you, and spoke to your heart. And I want you to respond by thanking him. Because church, while we were still sinners, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and offer us salvation so that you and I wouldn't have to die, we wouldn't have to be left lost and stranded and deserted on this dark planet, but we could be reclaimed, redeemed, and brought home. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all that you do. I thank you for strengthening us when we are weak. I thank you for seeking us relentlessly. And I thank you for being not only the shepherd, but our great high priest, Lord, ministering your blood upon us daily so that we can remain in salvation. Today we come to you and we empty ourselves and ask that you fill us with the Holy Spirit. Forgive us of our sins. In your holy name, amen. I believe our hymn today, oh, we have another song.
closing hymn, let's all stand and sing hymn number 213, Jesus is Coming Again. Father, again, we want to just thank you for this Sabbath. We want to just thank you for this beautiful day. As we exit this building today, Lord, we just pray that your spirit will go with us. Let us get through another week, Lord. And this week, help us to have opportunities at the workplace, at the store, everywhere we go, to share with someone about you, whether it be just a kind smile or whether it be a 20-minute conversation, Lord. We want to bless the food that we're about to partake. And I just ask that you continue to walk with us. In your name, amen.